Good afternoon, everyone. Come on in. Everybody's still coming in from the waiting room. We'll give it another minute and then get started with the National RIA update call for February, the second month of 2021 that is almost over already. <laughs> All right, well, as we still have people coming in from the waiting room, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to the National Real Estate Investors Association. Uh, this is the, the RIA Now update call for February the 19th, 2021. I'm Ryan Coleman, president, and I'm going to turn this over to our executive director, Rebecca McLean. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, today, we will have some special guests. Uh, Charles Tassel, our COO and Director of Legislative Affairs, will be here, but he'll be talking with uh, Rob Picola with the Institute for Justice, and they'll talk to you about some of the things that they're seeing and some of the initiatives that are uh, moving forward. And then, um, for many of you, it's why you're on the call today, David Pickron with Rent Perfect, who has been on several times before, one of our uh, very supportive and awesome partners, will be here today to talk about kind of the state of the rental market and some of the things that he sees and some tips for you as we move forward in this very interesting of all times. I said on the call Wednesday, for those of you that were on the call, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times, is actually more of a curse than a uh, blessing in any way. And certainly it is true as we go from uh, a very odd and interesting 2020 into a equally odd so far and interesting 2021. I think many of us thought that we would go to bed on uh, the night of the uh, December 31st and wake up with a fresh start in 2021, or at least that was our hope, and that didn't quite happen. So um, because it didn't, we're continuing these calls and trying to support you in that. Our sponsor, uh, as always, is the Home Depot Pro, and with the Pro Extra program through National RIA, we have some special programs for investors, discounts of uh, immediately of up to 20% off uh, paint. We have rebates. We have some other exclusive programs. So check with your local RIA if you would like to know more about that, or you can contact us. We are a nonprofit trade association, been around for over 35 years now, and our mission is to promote, protect, and educate for the real estate investment industry. We've got over 120 local chapters serving well over 40,000 members now within our group. We want to thank you so much for being here in the spirit of Valentine's Day, saying uh, thank you to you and appreciate your being on the call. If you do have questions about uh, more about what belonging to a local RIA means, if you're not already a member, you can, first of all, with their COVID-19 information, you can find that on our website there in the yellow highlight at the top of the browser. All kinds of free information, resources, the things that you need to know right there under the COVID-19 tab. If you'd like some more information about your local RIA, if you scroll over, I am an investor, you'll see the find a local RIA right there and you can find a local RIA in your area. Just a disclaimer, we will be talking about some legislative items that have financial implications. We'll be doing that on the uh, Rent Perfect side today, too, and maybe even talking about some things that have legal implications. However, none of us are practicing, at least right now, uh, real estate or uh, attorneys or otherwise, CPAs or other financial advisors. So if you have questions about any financial information or legal implications of any of the things that we talk about today, please talk to someone locally that understands your situation, your area, and the rules there. I also want to say thank you to the CBR team, CBRE team, especially the team here in Cincinnati, is the information that I'll be talking about at the end of the program is from information that they supplied to us and a very excellent presentation they've done 
here locally. Now, though, I will turn it over to Charles to talk about where we are with some legislative items, some things happening um, in the industry and in general, and let him introduce you to our special guest. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, welcome, everyone. Trying to bring some positive news. So with that mentality, I want to share a couple of things with you. Um, one is we actually had an interesting meeting earlier this week um, with a group called Family Promise. And the idea behind meeting with Family Promise, um, their uh, chief executive officer and myself were on a couple of HUD panels last year that HUD had called us in. We were the experts speaking on a few different issues and kind of giving uh, perspectives from property owners, um, housing providers, and sharing a few different things. One of the things that we discussed was our organizations maybe working a little more closely together and the idea behind it um, and, and Jane I don't know if your ears were burning the other day we were on the meeting I mentioned I might want to get you connected up with them as well part of the idea was a lot of times we're on a legislative front we're out there saying no 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 and this organization is also working with some solutions they have some good ideas coming forward and especially in some of our more progressive communities um, they're going to be looked on very favorably, and this is a good chance for our partnerships and our organization to work together. One of the things that they do behind the scenes is actually training um, for tenants. So they will help train tenants. They also do um, partnerships with them. Their typical chapter will have somewhere around 1,500 partners involved, and they will do mentoring with a resident, help bring them up to speed, and then do training. And they also bring it in from a, what I perceived as a very um, even-handed approach. So it's not, hey, we need to blame the evil landlord for whatever. It's, we need to work with the housing providers. We need to work with these things. There is a bill that needs to be paid called rent and those things need to be handled. So working with them. So as this kind of goes up, goes forward and moves forward, uh, we'll be sharing this with more folks, but I kind of want to give you a heads up. That's one of the things coming. Um, and along those lines, speaking of which, uh, as you know, there's, I was just in D.C. this weekend. The fences are still up around the Capitol. Um, you can't get in anywhere. And with COVID, it's not likely to be able to get in and have meetings anyway. So there's no advocacy group this year. We're not going up to do lobbying. Um, we are going to do something a little bit different. And on March 10th at 2 until 4.30, we're going to do a little kind of meeting um, update. And Don Schaefer had jogged a, kind of an idea on something and want to I say it because I want to appreciate him for this and reached out to a couple of folks who have been in administrations, have been legislators, and can share what it looks like from that side to say, this is what's effective, this is not what's effective. And I wanted to share that with you because a lot of times we're in there pounding away and thinking, and sometimes we walk away going, nothing seemed to work, or man, that really worked well, what happened? And they can kind of share from a panel perspective a little bit, kind of pull the curtain aside to say, here's what's going on. Here's what really did impact and what didn't impact. Um, so that that's a couple of the pieces I want to talk about that are coming up. I've got some more legislative issues to go through and I want to touch on those, but I want to stop first and, and bring in, and I really appreciate my friend Rob Piccola here. Uh, he's with the Institute for Justice. I know you guys have heard me speak about them over the years. We've, we've written, touched base on them. We've shared some of Institute for Justice's um, actions um, and their efforts that they're doing. And I really asked uh, Rob to come in on this because I called him probably almost a month ago and said, man, I feel like I'm getting overwhelmed with stuff just kind of blowing up at the local level, the state level, and especially at the local level, seeing just one municipality after another go, yeah, that's your constitutional rights. But that's nice. That, that argument doesn't hold sway here. We want to do this and move forward. And with that, he shared with me that, uh, and Rob, how was it? You, you, you're reaching more, more lawsuits at this point than at any other time, I think. So with that, um, Rob, could you just share a little bit about what you're seeing and what you're doing in preserving our constitutional rights? Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to speak with you folks. And frankly, the reason is because at the Institute for Justice, we represent uh, you folks. Uh, we represent um, small to big, um, but all family business landlords and their tenants uh, in lawsuits across the country to 
preserve uh, the Fourth Amendment and state a constitutional equivalents to the Fourth Amendment against these rental inspection programs. Maybe if I could see a quick show of hands, how many of you in the course of your business or in dealing with your tenants have dealt with what you thought were invasive inspections that a municipality uh, was doing against people's will? Okay, I'm seeing quite a few hands. Um, I'm not surprised to see that, unfortunately, because as Charles mentioned, these laws are, are sort of sprouting up like weeds across the country. Um, they can have a few different flavors that they take on. Sometimes it's a town's way of having a tough on crime type of initiative where rather than having to get a criminal search warrant, they're able to enter people's home without a search warrant pursuant to uh, what's known as an administrative search warrant, which some of you may have encountered before if, for example, your tenant, which is their right, objected to a search without a warrant. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1991. And one of our pillars that we work on are constitutional cases involving property rights. And in the chat, I'm going to um, put links to several of the uh, rental inspection challenges that we have uh, right going on right now. Um, these are cases that uh, are in various parts of the country. One is in a Chicago suburb of Zion, Illinois. Um, one is in a um, Metro Philadelphia uh, suburb of Pottstown. Um, and then the other is in uh, Seattle, which uh, some of you may know is, uh, has a notorious city council when it comes to uh, overreach, when it comes to people's privacy and constitutional rights. <clears throat> so that's a summary of who we are and what we do. And what is, the, what is the point? Why do we do this? Well, we have some big goals in mind. As constitutional lawyers, our long-term goal is to change the law through the highest court we can get to. And that's either a state Supreme Court or the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court uh, released a very bad case, again, that some of you may have heard of in the 1960s uh, called Camara, uh, C-A-M-A-R-A, -A -A, also pronounced camera, which created the sort of gremlin that we now know to be administrative search warrants, search warrants that didn't require actual showing of probable cause that something is wrong inside the house. We have not come across the right case at the moment for challenging that in, in federal court, at least at this time on its terms. But what we found is that there are several state constitutions that have much broader protections for people's privacy against illegal searches and seizures than does the Fourth Amendment. In fact, in Pennsylvania, where we're litigating our uh, case against the borough of Pottstown, their constitution was drafted in 1776 uh, before the federal constitution. Um, and when a lot of ugly memories were fresh of uh, you know having to have subservience to the crown when it came to uh, the privacy in your home. So this is serious business. And we found that it's sort of a gap in the case law. And I think that's why these municipalities are getting away with it and why I saw such a wide uh, a range of, of hands being raised is because they're popping up all over. So as you can imagine, this is a battle that we are fighting on many fronts. Um, we do have states that I said that we've identified that we think um, have promising uh, law within their state constitution. Um, if there's any folks in Iowa or Arkansas that uh, happen to um, have heard of the uh, particularly invasive uh, program, reach out to me. Um, I'll, I'll make sure there's a link to my contact information. But, um, you know, sometimes it takes years or even decades to make this kind of change. And we appreciate you guys um, having paid attention to our cases. And of course, Charles, for having been such a great sort of um, spokesperson for these constitutional issues and for uh, bringing folks like us um, into to conversation with you. So um, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I guess 
one final thing I'll say is that, you know, we have been fighting these cases for decades now, um, and we do it all uh, with donor support. We're a 501c3, as you can imagine, because we always sue the government, we don't get any government funding or grants. Um, so it's, it, we always like to know people that if they're thinking about charitable giving, um, it, it really helps keep these long constitutional fights going. So thank you so much for uh, letting me talk a little bit about IJ and what we're doing on the rental inspection front. Well, I, I appreciate it, Rob, and appreciate all you guys are doing. Um, please go ahead and post up there. I posted up there IJ's link, um, and then, but also, you know, we, uh, I think Brad mentioned that there's also a number of articles that we've shared and some of the successes you guys have had in different cases, and we want to continue doing that. Um, as you mentioned, uh, those of you in Iowa, in Arkansas, if you've got friends there, family members, business partners, um, please share that with Rob. Part of what we've done in the past is Rob will say, hey, do you guys have anybody in this area? And the reason for it is we're looking for a fact pattern, we're looking for a, a, a somebody who's a good housing provider, who does it ethically, who does it right, that may be getting hit by one of these rules or these laws that come forward. So um, periodically, you'll see an email from me, hey, to this area, anybody in this community, please, as leaders, reach out to your community, or, you know, as individuals, you might get a broader email from us, and that's part of what we're looking for. Um, kind of, as you mentioned, Rob, in, in dealing with the camera case, it'd be great to challenge it, but you want to have the right fact pattern when you run up against that windmill. It's, it's not something where you just run up against it regularly, because that's expensive. That's right. And it always helps to have a state Supreme Court give you a ruling to then sort of export and say, look at this great analysis, um, or even a dissent, frankly, from a state court judgment um, can, along the line of, of years of doing this, really make a difference. But as, as Charles said, the thing that matters more than anything else is the fact pattern. And that's because of you think this is really about as personal a case as it gets. Some of the tenants have been living in these homes for years. They've raised their children there. They have uh, had all of their family activity. And now in COVID, it's the complete center of their life. And there tends to be a view from the government that just mm -hmm. because they are renting as opposed to owning that space, that it's somehow um, a diminished level of privacy they have. But when you think about what these inspectors do, they go into people's bedrooms, they open closets, they embarrass people looking under the bed, they can see information about a holy book that someone might have open, they, have, uh, they might see political information that somebody has about a campaign they're working on. They could see prescription medication. And most disturbingly, when I was taking the deposition of the chief inspector in our Pottstown case, we learn that he instructs uh, his inspectors if they see something that they subjectively think is evidence of, of drugs that they just call the police. So people have actually been arrested as a result of these uh, rental inspection programs that are ostensibly done to help these folks. So the stories from the tenants are so compelling because I think that it's easy for the law to forget that these are their homes. Absolutely. Um, Rob, thank you for that. And again, as you have more cases coming up, please share them with us if there's anything. And we'll continue to follow up with both Arkansas and Iowa um, and appreciate what you're doing out there. Uh, I'm sure uh, I'll introduce if you hang around a little bit, too, you'll hear from Dave Pickron here. And he and I were talking a little bit before this started. There's some other issues going on that uh, might be of interest as well. So a little bit of privacy issue there. So We'll get, continue to get those connected up and get you guys connected up as well. But uh, Rob, thank you for coming on with Institute for Justice and what you're doing and, and keep keep the good fight, brother. We appreciate well, it. Thank you so much. And thanks for what sure. all of you guys are doing. You know, you're you're the reason that um, a lot of folks have a roof over their, their head and, you know, you're providing a lot of families with homes and with the experiences that shape their lives. So thank you. Absolutely. So I want to share a few things with everyone on kind of the legislative front. Um, a little bit of an update on the federal eviction um, from the moratorium side to the money side, and just kind of run through a few different items here for everybody. So um, one of the things, just a reminder, the uh, eviction moratorium 
has been extended. Um, it was, yeah, I should say it's to March 31st presently. Um, there's an expectation that it is going to go forward. It will not go forward in the next stimulus bill. And part of the reason for that is it's a budget bill and procedurally you cannot put something that's not budget oriented in a budget bill. So this will most likely move forward. The expectation is it will either come directly from the president through an executive order or it will be as was done previously in January, there will be a request from the president's office over to the CDC to extend it out. And the expectation is September 30th is when it will be extended to. Um, again, that's in process, but expected to come. Um, and usually kind of paralleling that is over at FHA and through HUD, there's the foreclosure um, ban as well. And it's a for, and this is where people are getting confused because there's a foreclosure and foreclosure eviction ban that's been extended um, till June 30th. And so that is out through the HUD side of things. So you're not gonna, so anybody doing business on foreclosures, well, it's gonna be dry for a little while and it's gonna continue to be dry for a while. So just FYI on that. Um, I do wanna mention, there's been behind the scenes with the Housing Coalition, a couple of things going on. One is there's about a 50 plus page document provided in late January to the Biden administration saying, hey, um, yeah, this declaration from the CDC is nice, but it's got all these loopholes in it. And they gave 50 pages of reasons why these loopholes should be eliminated. And what they really wanted was literally a universal declaration, which meant that every resident automatically had a right not to be evicted. I just say that every resident had a right not to be evicted and to be assumed that if they couldn't pay, it was because of COVID. And needless to say, there's been a housing coalition response to that. We're part of that and saying, no, absolutely not. There needs to be communication. There does not need to be an absolute, you know, somebody should take the effort and say, yes, here's how I've been impacted. Here's the declaration. Here's how I've personally been impacted by it and, and provide that information. Um, additionally, one of the things that we mentioned was that there needs to be some clarification with the courts as well, because literally in each courtroom, it is different how this is being treated. Judges are treating it differently. Magistrates are being treated differently. And it is being treated differently across the country. So we're, we're asking for more uh, of a uniform approach, a little homogeneity there, because this is coming out from the CDC. It's supposed to be federally applied equally to everyone. And it is not doing that at this present time. So that, that's part of the request as well. Um, the rental assistance that was passed back in December, um, I'm hearing that the funds are actually hitting the municipalities, the states at this point. That is a good thing. The money's there. And surprise, not all the rules are in place yet. So a number of them have said, okay, we've got funds from the treasury. Now what do we do? And because of that, they're a little bit concerned on how to spend it yet. So the expectation is they're probably not going to spend it yet. It will be done soon. Um, as soon as they get the rest of the rules in from the treasury, which are expected literally any day in the next, any time in the next couple of days. Um, and when that's done, each municipality, we've had, I think, five more states build in um, eviction programs, or excuse me, uh, emergency rental assistance programs. Those are coming forward. So we're seeing more of that. Um, this is a focus again, 80% of AMI. But Remember, if somebody loses their job because of COVID, it doesn't matter if they were making $20,000 a year or $150,000 a year. The moment they lost their job due to COVID, they are now classified as 0% AMI. So even if they made it three quarters of the way through the year, once they lost their job because of the, the COVID relation or whatever it was, and typically we're talking service workers were typically the ones who are most likely impacted, they are then eligible for these funds. Um, 25 billion, again, on our website, if you go to real estate investing today as well, we've got it posted, how much money is coming out to each area. And also one of the key things, I'll reiterate this, who's actually receiving the money, which organization, which municipality, which government entity is actually receiving the money. So you can make sure you reach out to them and work with them, partner with them. We've been encouraging that. We've seen some, some loosening of um, some of the regulations, some places have said, hey, we want 10% haircuts, we want this, we want that, have started to back off some of that based on here's what the federal language is, we're just going to follow the federal rules, and that's how the money will come out. Um, one of the things I will encourage everyone on, 
this is a massive amount of money. It is not enough to actually meet the demand that is expected to be out there. Goldman Sachs has said that they believe it might be up to $70 billion, 70 with a B, that is actually in arrearage at this point. There's 25 billion that came through in December. Right now, the number currently in the house is looking at somewhere around 19 billion. They're scrolling that back a little bit. Originally it was 25. Um, that they're trying to get through by mid-March. Part of the reason they're trying to get that through by mid-March, by the way, is unemployment insurance runs out in mid-March and that will be part of what will come forward. So expect to see some movement on that probably over the next two weeks here. Um, moving off of rental, uh, emergency rental programs and such, I wanna mention a couple other things. With a different administration in place, um, there is, again, we're hearing more messaging about energy efficiency in buildings and those individuals who were in the um, energy department and with HUD previously during the Obama years are now back in place and they were picking up where they left off discussing what does it mean to make buildings more energy efficient and also broadcast that they are. Um, the Housing Coalition has put forward a, a program called EQUIP, which is kind of a different way to handle it rather than setting extensive standards out there. It, it is a bill that will be coming in. And as that bill comes in, um, one of the things it does is a 10 year straight line depreciation for equipment that's brought in. So it kind of does the carrot side of things that if you do energy efficiency products, you can then depreciate them and, and, and put some timeline in there for it not being 28, 30 years out for depreciation on products that typically don't last that long. So that's part of what's out there. Again, this is a, a kind of a proactive step to figure out how we can make solutions out of what's going on. Um, liability protections. Um, I'll just tell you right now, I do not see this coming at the federal level. Um, it is out there, it is talked about in the House and Senate. Uh, one of the biggest champions of this has been um, minority leader Mitch McConnell, who again, now that he's minority leader, this is less likely to go anywhere. So I don't expect to see liability protections coming forward from the federal level keep an eye out for them at your state level. Um, and uh, again, I'll mention state level issues in, in the sense that folks, we've got uh, Bill Track 50 on our site. Um, check that, you can check, uh, we've got seven different categories that are up there. Um, if you wanna go in and look at them, I encourage you to and tell you which bills are coming up as they're moving. Uh, your local associations can also track their state individually. This is something that you can use because these bills are coming and there's a lot of them coming fairly rapidly at this point. So I just want to mention that. Um, in a, uh, this is not a fun one. Um, there are additional levels of kind of temporary e eviction restrictions sitting in place and we're seeing more of them and rental regulations formulating around local municipalities not so much at the state levels, we're seeing a little bit there, but we're seeing it especially at the local level saying, hey, we wanna put this in place and we're just gonna ram it forward, which is, again, it was, it was a few things like that. That's part of why I called Rob in the first place and said, oh my word, I can't believe all these municipalities are just, it seemed like in January, they just erupted. Um, so folks, this is, this is going to continue. I really encourage you to pay attention at your local level because one of the things you don't wanna see is a supposed short-term pandemic um, solution morph into a long-term policy. And that's typically what we're gonna see. Okay. So I'm gonna, for sake of time, I won't go through every, every single bill that we have here. I've got literally um, pages of bills and literally <laughs> lots of notes on those, but I encourage you to go check out Bill Track 50. Um, on our website. We've got lots of information there and, and, and there's a lot more coming. And one of the things that's coming, you guys will hear this, it's called right to counsel. And this is where municipalities, some states will actually require because don't we know that every housing provider has an attorney when they come to eviction and that poor resident doesn't necessarily have an attorney. What they forget to tell you is that the courts actually mandate if you have an LLC or some other sort of corporation, you have to have an attorney. That's why we have to have the attorneys there in the first place. But they're saying now legal aid or some other group needs to come in and represent the residents. And in those cases, they can then, rep, you know, they'll, they'll, 
they'll delay the case, they'll cause more time. And by the way, the cost of that should also be put onto the property owners and housing, which increases the cost of housing and is actually anathema to housing affordability. So again, whenever we get lawyers involved, no offense, Rob, it gets more expensive. <laughs> it just gets more expensive when they do this. So um, we all know that. And so this is one of the things when you when you see right to counsel, please beware. Um, we want our good we want our good attorneys out there being able to work on things, not just tons of attorneys out there just billing hours. So uh, with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up here again, Bill Track 50, please check it out. Um, there's a lot of issues going on at the state level. Stay plugged in at your municipal level. And if you're seeing issues that you think need is a good case, bring it up, bring it out, reach out to me. Um, we can work on it, see if there's something there we can put together. Um, reach out to Rob. Again, his information with Institute for Justice is on there. We want to make sure we're addressing these issues and continue to move forward, not only on the legislative front, but on the judicial front and also on the relationship front. So I encourage you to keep reaching out to people. With that, thank you guys very much and more updates to come. Thanks, Charles. And definitely everyone, if something comes up in your area, whether you think we've heard about it or not, please reach out to Charles to let him know just in case. Um, also, before we let Rob go and Charles, before you uh, sign off, there are a couple questions that came up in the chat bar and then to me uh, via email. Um, if they want to find local laws reg regarding residential inspections, where do they find that info? Now, I know every local area is different, but generally through the building department or if they could search Google, can you give them some hints and tips on how do they know exactly what those uh, laws look like for them in their local area? Most areas will have a department of licensing and inspection or um, a housing department or uh, some sort of bureaucracy in place. And most times they will on the um, housing, I'm sorry, on the um, inspection department's website have a link to the code. Um, some of the more organized cities will also have sometimes bullet points about what landlords need to know, what the requirements are. Of course, one thing is universal about these, which is they will not mention anything about the constitutional rights of the renters, which is to decline the inspection and demand a warrant, um, which is, I think, information that's helpful for renters to have. Um, if you think, for example, if you are pulled over by an officer um, for a routine speeding ticket, it's people should know that they do not have to consent to an officer searching their trunk, for example. Well, the same thing is if a someone from licensing and inspection comes to the tenant's home, they, the, it is unconstitutional to require them to consent or to punish them or to punish their landlord because as I'm sure you've all noticed, landlords are so often dragged in to be the city's enforcer. Rather than doing the dirty work, sometimes they'll issue daily fines against the landlord as a way to coerce social pressure on that tenant to consent to an inspection, even though they don't want to. So beware of that too. Thanks so much. Um, so it's all local. Make sure you're checking at your specific local area, not using somebody else's local um, information for you. Charles, other questions. Difference between um, rental uh, moratorium that we've talked about and then the new foreclosure moratorium and the evictions connected to that. What's the difference there um, based on which each of those covers? Uh, definitely, since there is a timeline difference, please. So, yeah, the, the, the right now, in the sense that the, the moratoriums are both further out than where we're at, they're both in place. So both of these have started last year. Um, the actual foreclosure eviction moratorium, and I call it foreclosure and eviction moratorium because it's evictions out of foreclosures, started last year, I believe in June was when FHA actually started moving forward with that. Um, the CDC eviction moratorium for non-payment actually started September 4th of last year. And those are two different issues. So the uh, FHA HUD-based eviction foreclosure moratorium is based on if there's a foreclosure, not being able to evict the person who is in foreclosure. So that's, that's one track. That's the one that's out till June 30th at this point. 
The other track is through the CDC, which is where there's a dec declaration that a resident can come up with and say, not only was I impacted by it, oh, by the way, I have gone through and tried to find money. And if I have any money, I will pay that money to you to help cover the cost of the rent. Um, that is a, that's the CDC process and what we consider the eviction moratorium that is in place until March 30th or 31st, excuse me, but will most likely be extended till the end of September. Hopefully that was helpful. It was. And I <laughs> um, to one thing I do want to mention, I, I will mention this real quick. I, I, I'll do this in prelude to our, our, our friend Dave Pickron coming up here. Um, with local municipalities taking on and making more changes, it is really important to make sure you know what you're doing behind the scenes if you're doing any screening. And the place I'm going to call out right now is St. Paul, Minnesota, that they've got a law that goes into effect on March 1st. Again, overly burdensome resident screening law. Um, won't go into details, take all the time. I don't want to steal any thunder. But there, there are not just states that are breaking this down. There are municipalities that are doing this. And there are more municipalities considering it. Uh, Florida is looking at some legislation. This is stuff you've got to pay attention to because if you don't and you make a mistake, it's going to cost you huge. So with that, I'll I know Dave's, over to Dave's going to talk a, uh, a lot about that and about how his system in the areas where things actually have gone into effect, um, that's why we love him, has, has taken such good care of our people to um, to work on that, but we'll get to that two Absolutely. seconds. Dave, I'm so sorry, but I've just got a couple, I've got a couple more things over here in the chat. I got to grab. Um, Lori did put in the chat bar uh, links to the FAQ on um, the stimulus package. Also, um, your local RIA, we've asked them to load up those spreadsheets about the agencies in your area. But if you aren't getting that from your local RIA, you can get that spreadsheet from the links that Lori has sent as well about the agencies that are uh, in charge of administration of those funds and how you would go about helping your resident get those funds for rental assistance. So that's there. Um, she put the the link for the advocacy in there. Also, just to let you know, we have released to the group leaders, but if you haven't seen it yet, we have an awesome brochure that our team has put together for owners and managers of rental property to give to their residents that talks about the moratorium, about how, yes, if you, opt, first of all, the conditions that it takes, at least by the bill that, um, or by the administration that, that they have to certify that certain things are accurate before they're supposed to be able to do that. Um, so it reminds the, the resident of that. And it also talks about the long-term effect of not paying rent if you can, um, and that you really need to have open communication with the uh, property owner or manager. So that brochure does that. And then the entire back page is for you to modify for yourself about your local resources, both the agencies that are getting federal funding and potential social or religious agencies that have funding available for rental assistance and or other needs like food pantries and those sorts of things. So Lori, if you could put that um, link for that download in there as well. And then Brad has a lot of things, a lot of resources also on real estate investing today. He has put many of those links in as well. Um, Hold on, I'm seeing lots of things over here. Charles and Rob both put their email addresses in the chat bar. So um, take a look at those and copy them for future use. Um, Rebecca, there, there was a question up there about the uh, most uh, friendly landlord states or housing provider states. Um, periodically on real estate investing today, we'll share reports that say, you know, here's a chart of the top 10 or the least 10 or the worst 10. Um, we have not done that internally in the sense that some of it is very subjective. What are you used to working with? What are you not used to working with? And, and that can impact it. There are some places, thank you, California, and a few other places um, that make it very difficult. But other than that, we have not done that. But I would suggest that you keep an eye out on real estate investing today because I know that periodically um, Brad does post those up of some different elements of what why something is friendly or why it's not friendly. 
Yes, he also did an excellent article. It's probably two, almost three years ago now, and I know we've probably done some updates, but the one that struck me at the time and used it in an industry presentation were uh, property tax rates as, you know, uh, where how those look across the U.S. So uh, those are kind of data points that Brad keeps on real estate investing today. He's awesome at that. Um, you can either come visit that on a daily basis to check it out or a weekly basis, or if you subscribe to the weekly roundup, then um, that will put you into the system and you get a weekly review of our top stories for that week. So if you want to subscribe and get that delivered to your inbox, uh, comes to you on Friday as a uh, review of the week, then uh, feel free to do that. You can either do that from the subscribe section of the front side of the website, or you can email us at info at nationalria.org to get on that list. Um, another quick question, are there any creative ways to draft a lease to mitigate a rental non-payment due to coronavirus? Does a co-signer help? <laughs> we want Dave to, well, let's leave that for a second. Maybe Dave can handle that. I will tell you, I am not an attorney. I am not gonna give legal advice. I'm not going yeah. anywhere near that. But let me say this, I, because I have student housing, have a co-signer provision in there anyway. Um, and Dave's product allows you to screen the incoming resident and the co-signer. So knowing that there will be a hit to that co-signer's credit may or may not be a concern to said co-signer. But I'm gonna let Dave handle that, talk about the capabilities of the system and, um, you know, why doing a screening on all parties involved could be helpful in choosing the best resident uh, going forward. Um, so there's one other question on there and it's a question regarding the GSEs and family, Fannie and Freddie. Um, my understanding is that June 25th, 26th of last year, the Fannie Freddie um, eviction moratorium as it were, that was specific targeted toward properties with the federal backing on them that expired at that time that was the last i am aware of that um having said that that's part of where the cdc moratorium kicks in afterwards um, my understanding is there was a discussion about internally within the administration that this is going on so what do we do um that's where it's gone now there was, there's behind the scenes that if you participated in that moratorium, um, and what I mean by that is if you said, okay, we're going to not have to pay our, our bill. So you have a hundred unit apartment building that has a, a Fannie or Freddie backed loan on it. And you said, we're not gonna pay our loan for X amount of time. Then you couldn't evict the residents until sometime after you had caught up on your loan. Right? We got pretty archaic in the rules on it. So just, unless you've got that Fannie Freddie backing on it, that's, don't worry about that whole rule. That was a whole different archaic setup. Focus on these two, which is foreclosure and eviction or just eviction through the CDC and the moratorium as it's called in the declaration because of it. Thanks Charles. If you have other questions, you can always email those to Charles. Um, after this session ends, but we kept Dave on hold for far too long. There was just so much, not necessarily good news, but things you needed to know about under the legislative side. But I know most of you came today to hear him. So without further ado, David, sir, can you tell us about what you're seeing um, happening in the rental environment? Tell us there's hope uh, and how to, you know, use the rent perfect system to get the best results we possibly can. Well, well, it's interesting because I'm sitting there going, I'm supposed to teach after Charles's, you know, update and, and the craziness that's, uh, that's coming through. But what I wanted to, to talk about today is what, what we are teaching local is what we are teaching our clients uh, to get through this. Now, I'm going to come out with a little bit of bad news, too. It just seems to be we can't get away from it. Um, years ago, people came in and said, oh, we can no longer use the word landlord. Landlord, it's a housing provider, and you shouldn't use the word landlord. And, and well, I'm going to tell you guys today, 100%, I believe this, none of you anymore are landlords. You now are property managers for a private property for the federal government. 
Now think about that. I'm going to say that again. You no longer are landlords. You are a property manager for private property that's really run by the federal government. They now are the landlords. And I know that's depressing to hear, but we are losing our authority and our rights and our freedoms over our own property. Now, I know that's not what you wanna hear. You wanna hear hope, you wanna hear, but my thinking is this. Today, we're teaching our clients a lot. We're gonna have a little presentation here in a second about having a criteria, set your criteria. But you mentioned the St. Paul that goes in March 1st. They set your criteria for you, three-year misdemeanor, seven-year felony. Fair Housing came out a long time ago and said, don't go over seven years on your background checks. They are telling us how to run our properties and it's scary. Do you think once this eviction moratorium goes away, say it's March, say it's September, say who knows next, who knows when this thing's going away. Do you think the next catastrophe that happens, they're not going to get their nose underneath the tent again and say, hey, this worked for us this time. 10 years ago, we never worried about an eviction moratorium. We didn't think that that was possible. And now guess what? That's one of the tools that the federal government is going to use into the future. So I'm hoping Rob and his team or someone else's team can say, hey, federal government, you're stepping way overboard here. You're doing it slowly, a little at a time, and you're using this pandemic to really make policy that's going to last a lifetime. So think about that. When you think about I'm no longer a landlord, I'm just kind of managing a property for the federal government. It kind of makes you mad. But that's where we are going. Rob, thank you for all you're doing. And we certainly hope that uh, you guys continue. And I will tell you, I took your email here. We're going to send you some money. I was on a call a little while ago saying, I just want to know where to put my money this year. That protects the smaller landlord. And so um, you've got our support. And we will get together and see what we can do to get you guys a little bit of money. We appreciate what you're doing. I actually have some tenants that I would love for the city to come inspect. And I'll place a bong on the table or something just to you know, get them out. But um, I'm being a little facetious. Time there. Limits. <laughs> yeah. I'm being a little facetious there. Um, certainly love my tenants that are in my properties and I want them protected just as much as I want my property protected and me protected too. So Heather, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Hi everyone. Okay, yeah. let's, let's go ahead and put up us a little uh, PowerPoint we can go through here. And uh, there's some good things here at the end. There's, there's, we're gonna go through where, where we're at today, but there's some good things at the end. Keep in mind before uh, why Heather's getting started, keep in mind that if you had the right renter in your property in 2020 and here in 2021, you're not affected by this eviction moratorium much because you've gotten paid. Um, so our whole key right now is as we are screening people, we used to always say, man, it's one of the most important things to do, but there has never been a time where you need to find the right renter more than now, because the wrong renter will cost you a ton of money. Here's the reality. You buy a home, and, and, and a lot of people in RE and a lot of investors are always talk about the home, the home, the investment, how much am I going to make on it, the bricks and mortar. Do you know how valuable a good tenant is nowadays? I mean, think of this. If you can get the right tenant to live in your property for five years, there's $120,000 approximately coming your way. That tenant is worth $120,000. And so nowadays as investors, we have to take a little less you know, thought about the bricks and mortar and we need to think more about how are we gonna put the right people in our property and go through the right processes so we don't violate the regulations, so we don't get sued. And people now are becoming harder to find. I mean, the rental pool out there right now that we're seeing come in through our, our system is atrocious. And we're teaching our clients how to go get the good guys in the rental pool and get rid of the bad guys. Well, what's the, what's the cities, the counties and the states trying to do? They're trying to force the problems on us by, by making all these regulations and taking away our ability to make choices. They don't want us to make choices anymore. You're a housing provider, you open up, you give the keys to the first person who, who applies. And that's where we're at today. Um, I'm not saying it's a time to sell, I'm not saying it's a time to get out, but maybe if you're gonna invest some money into the future, go invest into a more conservative area, somewhere that's a little bit more landlord friendly. Uh, and you know maybe you might have some properties in a city that's really beating you up, maybe it's time to sell. And maybe it's time to move on. But what's funny is in the end is those cities aren't going to have any rentals for people to even live in. 
And uh, they're actually creating policies that are actually going to hurt them, their own sales in their own cities. So, okay, so regulation is turning private housing into public housing. They don't have enough public housing. They can't take care of the problem themselves. So the city councils are like, how can we solve the problem of homelessness, homelessness, drugs? Let's lay it on the backs of the landlords. So here's what they're doing to us. They're giving us screening companies more and more screening regulations. What we can and can't report to you. In California, for example, I can see a sex offender eight years ago. I can't report them to you because it's over seven years in California. Do you know how frustrating it is for a screening company to see that we're sending you someone that we think is going to be a liability and we're not allowed to tell you about it? And if we do, we break the law. So there are a lot of more and more screening regulations on us as professional credit reporting agencies not to give out information that we find and we see. It's hard on us. Um, there's bans and limits on the use of criminal history. Most of you know Seattle. You can't do a criminal history period in Seattle. And that went to the Washington Supreme Court and they cited on the, the side of Seattle. And hopefully that goes to the Supreme Court and we can, we can get a win there. I'm hoping, um, you know, but, but that hurts us when we can't do criminal histories. So we tell our clients in Seattle, kick up your credit scores. We, had, we don't see somebody who has an extensive criminal history all of a sudden be responsible uh, financially. Uh, but guess what happens when we give that advice? They're going to start coming after the credit and the credit scores. And we know that that's coming. Um, when we counter, they counter. And we counter and they counter. Um, eviction moratoriums you know about. Um, and, and we also talked about, Charles talked about counties and cities are getting involved. We used to worry about just the federal government, maybe a state statute that came through. Now, I used to cover 50 states, 3,500 counties. Now I'm worrying about over 17,000 cities and what are they doing and what I can give our clients, what our clients can use, how they can onboard tenants. It is, it is actually getting too much for screening companies to, to, to monitor that. We, we did something special for Jane Garvey up there in Chicago to ha help them with their certain process. But as I look at, at all these other cities, I don't know that I have the resources to build 17,000 different ways to onboard a tenant in these different municipalities. Now, here's a win for Arizona. We're out in Arizona. Pima County came in and said uh, a lot that that landlords are evicting for non-compliance. So if you have too many people in the home, you have pets that you're not allowed to have, landlords were using non-compliance to evict people when really they were covered under COVID. So they came in with a rule and said, you can't evict even non-compliance. And our state AG came back and said, hey, you don't have the authority to do that you better go back to the drawing board. They rescinded the rule and they're gonna address it again on March 3rd. But at least we have a state uh, attorney general that's saying, hey, you guys don't have the authority to make all these rules and laws. I don't know why other states won't follow. Maybe the conservative states will, but very few wins in there, but who knows March 3rd, what's, what's gonna come about them doing that. All right, Heather, let's move on. Uh, guys, you might've heard me say before, credit bureaus are losing vital information. They no longer provide liens, judgments, and evictions. That's where most screening companies are getting th that kind of information. Rent Perfect went to other resources to gather that information, um, but the credit bureaus are becoming less and less useful to us and people's credit scores are going up. If you see an article that says people's credit scores are going up, that's because they're not reporting bad credit as much as they used to. And so, you know, for example, when we report whether people pay rent or not, um, and we report that to the credit bureau, we can only report the positive, the negative we can't report. So you're gonna only see, if you're looking at rental credit, you're only gonna see positive rental credit. We're not allowed to- I wanna to hurt people's feelings, Dave. <laughs> yes, seriously. <laughs> okay, so, and records are getting more difficult for us to access. Um, for example, in New York, $99 to do a name search in the, in the uh, boroughs of New York. Um, and if you have multiple names, aliases names, if you're a female and you've been married and you had, you know, a couple names, that's, that's 99 times $2 or by times two in, in New York. Now we don't see that that's extreme, but we're seeing $5 here, $2 here. Uh, we're seeing, uh, wait times. We'll only do 10 backgrounds a day and you can get in order and, and they're trying to delay us. And our landlords don't want to wait. We need to get these reports in and we need to get people in our homes quickly. We don't have time to do employment backgrounds take five to 10 days. We do four to six hours at Rent Perfect. So we're getting squeezed out of a little bit of information that we can't get access to um, to give to our clients because these courts aren't cooperating. That's just not Rent Perfect. That's 
the screening industry in general. Um, and then more and more regulations, we're seeing more and more lawsuits against landlords. When there's more regulations, there's more places to make mistakes. And here comes the, uh, the attorneys. So um, I used to say to all of our clients, screen like you couldn't evict somebody. And I it was just a saying I said before all this, well, guess what today, literally, you better screen them because you can't evict them. And so we needed to make sure that we're keeping up on all of our tools that are available to us. Um, so we have you know, as much power as possible and we're losing it, but we need as much as we can. So appreciate that. Um, and then right now, really what we're teaching right now is to have a really good rental criteria. It's amazing to me how many landlords and clients we have. And we talk to them and we ask them about their rental criteria and they don't have one. They just say, well, I just, I rent to them if I like them. I rent to them if I just feel like, you know, they'd be a good fit. Right now with all of this legislation coming through, all this regulation coming through, you don't have the ability anymore to say, I didn't rent to them because I didn't like them. You have to prove now why they didn't get approved. And if you don't have a criteria, then everybody gets approved. We're pushing that message out through all reuse right now. And we're actually giving people a sample criteria that every landlord needs to have and needs to give to their applicants prior to running any screening. They now need to know this is what I'm looking for and this will decline you. Heather, let's show them what that looks like. It's not something written on a napkin. It's not something that's vague. It's something very specific. If you look at Minnesota, St. Paul right now, they're telling you that you can't go past seven years on a felony. You can't go past three years on a misdemeanor unless the felony, and let me look at this law directly since we mentioned it earlier, um, is murder, kidnapping, arson, assault, robbery, manslaughter, criminal sexual conduct, then you can go 10 years on that. So, so St. Paul decided that they're going to set your criteria for you. Um, so the rest of the country, we need to set a criteria. We need to make sure we run people, treat them fairly and run them against this criteria before we say yay or nay, whether you can move into the property. So my criteria right here for a higher end property in the suburbs of Arizona is now against the law in St. Paul because I go seven years on a felony, which, which we always have gone seven years since HUD laid down their seven year law on us years ago. Uh, but my misdemeanor is five years. Now my misdemeanor can't be five years. It can be three years. So if any of you want this criteria, it's just a sample. I don't want you to use it on your property, but it gives you an idea. And this is what we're teaching people to have this documentation. And we're teaching people to have it signed before you run the screening. So you can show them that I told you what it takes to apply. You applied and you failed it. And I took a, an application fee from you. I didn't want to take an application fee from you. I gave you every chance to say, I can't be approved here, but you went and did it anyways. So we go through misdemeanors, sexual related crimes. Now, one important thing about the way the attorneys have written this is, and I'm interested, I'm interested to see the full final text in St. Paul is, if you have a seven year criteria, and a guy's been in prison for seven years and he committed a crime and he got a seven year sentence and he's getting out seven years in one day, then he qualifies into your home unless you put in your criteria. Notice here on the second line in the past seven years from the date of the investigative report to the date of the conviction or release from custody or parole. We wanna make sure as landlords, these guys are out in society for seven days. I mean, sorry, seven years and make sure that they've had a chance to recommit. They've had a chance to do that. And so it's little language like that that we have to have in our criterias so we can protect ourselves from what's coming at us. If you're in St. Paul, you change the five years to three years. You might add another criteria in there that talks about 10 years for assault, robbery, manslaughter. Um, you know. So then they confuse us. They say, hey, no assault or robbery. Well, there's also a lower charge called theft and there is a theft felony in certain states. So you've got to kind of now figure out all of this criminal, how does how do the, all these charges blend into the screening and can you and can you not? So you need to now become a private investigator like us and know your criminal codes in each of your, your counties and your cities. Uh, you know, so you're gonna to have to become more educated on that. Um, 
Eviction criteria, we go through eviction criteria, I, I say any open eviction. I don't want, if you, if you didn't pay the last landlord, you're not moving into my property because I'm going to protect that last landlord. You can go back, clear up your judgment, clear up your collection, whatever you want. But uh, if you left them with an eviction, you're leaving me with an eviction. So that's kind of the criteria that we teach. Uh, credit criteria, credit scoring, this is 700 and above is, is, is approved if you have no criminal history. Um, but this is a high-end property right here. If you have a property that's in a, a lower part of the city, then maybe that's 550, maybe that's 600. You know, it's just up to you. Um, Heather, go to the next screen. We're also teaching right now to put a tenant advisory on this form. And by the way, this form is all done through Rent Perfect. You don't have to go to Word document. You come to Rent Perfect, you build it, you, you make your criteria, it makes it real easy. When you send out an invite to apply, it, it gives it to them automatically by email. So we've done stuff that makes this go to the applicants before they apply. So it makes it easy on you. But I do review the re residential lease prior to signing it. We're gonna go to court someday and we might have a judge that sides with the tenant and says, well, they didn't know. You know, I heard Charles talk about this new initiative to do this tenant training. We are going into the future now where we're almost gonna be responsible that the tenant didn't know something or the tenant wasn't able to pay the rent and somehow that's gonna become our fault because we didn't explain something or we didn't do something. So I make sure right now until all that comes down the pike that you put, you tell them exactly what they need to do at every step of the way. If they read it, great. If they don't, you can't make them read it, but I would have them initial this. And then in the Rent Perfect system, we have property related additional criteria. You can put anything you want in there um, at all that's specific to your city or specific to your criteria. And so we make making a criteria easy. And I will tell you the number one thing I choose to train on right now is to have a criteria because they are gonna eat you alive if you don't have one. In fact, they're even admitting here that most landlords don't have a criteria. So St. Paul, for example, just made one for you. Now, do you wanna be in control of your property or do you want the city telling you who can move in and who can move out? So we need to make sure that we take, we take that control. Any questions so far, Dave, Rebecca, you can come up? Yes. Dave, actually, Dave, can I jump in there for a second on sure. that? Absolutely. Um, because so let me reinforce something that you mentioned there, which is if you don't have criteria and you get questioned on it, and I will mention this specifically because I've had a resident we did a background check on who was in jail for literally nine years and within a week was coming around asking for an application and, and he, he literally was a murderer and there was a huge rap sheet. I'll leave it at that. I was questioned afterwards by the local federal uh, enforcement folks, you know, our, in our area, it's home. Uh, we also had the Lexington housing authority, uh, you know, fair housing group. And they came through and they said, well, here's my sheet that says everything on it. And they went, Oh, okay. So as long as you comply with your sheet, that's fine. You're still, you followed your rules. Yeah. And I said, so what happens if I, if I didn't have the sheet, they said, oh, the fines start at $5,000. And then we go back through your records that you're going to provide for us. And we start looking at who else you might've violated. And it's yes. $5,000 for each of those. And then we start discussing settlement from there. Yes. Yes. <sighs> but, but when you bought your first property, Charles, like me, I bought my second property, I didn't know anything about a criteria. I was just going to meet people. Did I like you? Could you afford it? Move in. And so a lot of new landlords that aren't coming to their RIAs, that aren't getting this training, they're going to get stuck on this. And I don't want anybody on this call or anybody part of RIA not to have this training. So we are giving this to all RIAs across the country right now. We're doing a lot of Zooms. We just did Traction RIA last night. Um, but there's two or three nights a week that we're, we're on these calls training people. So I invite you, if you're a RIA leader, uh, you know, we, that we come through and do a training with everybody just to get them really dialed in on having the, the right criteria. Um, Jane, you asked a question. Yes, the criteria is property specific. This is one of my nicer homes up in a nicer suburb. Um, I have a different criteria for every single property that I have. So and you can change your criteria. I mean, it doesn't mean once it's set in stone, you can't change it. So, you know, if I have a, a if I have a reason to change it, I'll, I'll change it. If a regulation comes through, I'll change it from five day, five years to three years, just like, uh, just like they're making me do in St. Paul. So. And Dave, there's one other question about: uh, Do you have suggestions for changes if uh, if they have student housing? 
Um, you know, student housing is interesting. When we do student housing, we don't have as many years back to really look at. We can look at most, most states allow us to look at just 18 and over. We can't go back into juvenile record. And so the reality is your criteria in student housing are really gonna be one to three years that they've even been able to commit those crimes. So if you say, hey, nothing for 10 years, well, you're only getting three years worth of data. So I wouldn't change it for student housing at all. Okay, um, Heather, let's move on to the next. Here's what else we're teaching to RIAs uh, around the country. Um, we're, we're going old school on our rental verifications. We don't have the ability right now. A lot of people are even scared to do the eviction filing in the court. So when we're looking at court records right now, we're not seeing the eviction filings that we used to see because people are afraid to even file the evictions because they're not really sure about this moratorium. If we don't see people filing the evictions, then we have to talk to the current landlord to make sure that they're getting paid their rent. Well, the current landlord wants them out. If you haven't been paid rent for five months and someone future landlord calls you and says, hey, how is their rent? You're gonna say, it's been beautiful. Just get them out of my house. I need to get a new tenant in here. So what we're doing is we're teaching to get proof of rental payments for the last 12 months. Um, whether that's through a bank statement or that's through canceled checks. I, wanted, I want you to prove to me how you've paid your rent because there's a chance that your current landlord's not gonna be truthful. Your second landlord back's not gonna know how you handled yourself in the pandemic, but your bank statements or your proof of payment will tell me. You could have lost your job, you could have went on unemployment and you could have still kept paying your rent. You could have went to your church, your family. I want that next renter of mine to be the responsible one that's jumping through hoops to get their rent paid, that that is valuable in their lives and that's of utmost importance to them. That's what I'm looking at for my future renters coming up this year. I don't want to get burned or I don't want to get burned again. So make sure you get proof of rent payments in your rental history. Even if you can't talk to the landlord, people have it on their phone, they can log into their bank, they can forward you their statements. Um, but it's a really good tool we're teaching right now to make sure you get uh, that rental verification done. All right, Heather, let's move on. Uh, Income verifications, we're getting W-2s. I'm sorry, not W-2s, paycheck stubs, four paycheck stubs. Like right now, I would ask for December 31st paycheck stub or the last bit of December's paycheck stub because that year to date is gonna show me exactly how long they've worked there, if they've worked there the whole year. And if I get multiple paycheck stubs and I look at the math in the year to date, I can tell it's not a fake one because they're, they're too lazy to make four paycheck stubs and make all of the, the numbers add up. So I would get four paycheck stubs. If you're close to the beginning of the year, like we are now, I'd make sure I jumped into last year's payment stub and double check their payment. The reason we're doing this is if you wanted to, to verify somebody at Walmart or verify somebody at Taco Bell right now, you're gonna get the work number. They're gonna to wanna to charge you $50 to do it. Right now, if we get paycheck stubs and I would call the Taco Bell where they work and just ask for that, ask for them. And when they say, yeah, just a minute, I then would hang up the phone. I don't really need to talk to them. I just want to make sure that they still are there. So if you get a no, he quit yesterday and you're looking at all these paycheck stubs that look good, but he just quit yesterday, you're going to realize he's not currently employed. That's how we're doing. We're teaching right now to do our employment verifications. Heather, I miss anything on that? No, I'm loving it. Um, I just like your comparison to when, you know, getting approved for a mortgage changed back, you know, after that big crash where, you know, it was so easy to get a mortgage and then they really had to crack down and they we're kind of going through the same thing right now with rentals, um, you know, asking for, you know, I think a lot of people would have asked for a paycheck stub, but asking for additional paycheck stubs, asking for the copies of checks, is just tightening up your, it's like a mini mortgage approval, you know, they're going to yeah. be yeah. paying yeah. your mortgage yeah. for, you know, a year or two, hopefully three or four. So just see what kind of hoops they'll jump through. You want someone that will make a little bit of effort, I've found. Um, if they're willing to go through the effort of getting these paycheck steps, getting the bank statements, it's not that big of a deal. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're more likely to make an effort when they fall into bad times and can't right. pay you. Absolutely. And Dave, you do have a couple questions if I could really quickly. Sure. 
Um, one is if I'm checking with the current previous landlord, what are they allowed to say if I ask how was the renter? Well, I wouldn't recommend getting into anything that's subjective. Um, you know, the, the place was dirty, their kids broke my fan. I, I wouldn't get into anything that you can't prove. I would ask yes or no questions, period. Did they pay the rent? Did they leave you with the rent paid? And did they give you proper notice to leave? That's it. Um, what about, could you ask, uh, one of the questions I used to ask is, did they leave the property in acceptable, not, well, I don't use the word acceptable because that's subjective, but anyway. Um, but, but the answer is yes or no. In whatever condition. Right, right. The answer is yes or no. You don't want to get into to, uh, subjective details. You, you put that landlord at risk and you can't prove it anyways. So, I think I asked if I, they left it without need for for extensive repairs the way I actually said. I think I heard a question and I'm obviously not an attorney, but I heard, did they get the full deposit back? Because that's a yes or no. Yes or no. Just and that's a much, kind much of better telling. question. Yeah. Thank so you. did they get the full deposit back? I think yeah, you, can, you can prove that if someone ever came and said, you've libeled me, you said you can prove yes or no questions. You can't prove anything subjective or opinionate, you know? So guys, I'm not an attorney either. I don't play an attorney. I'm not, I'm not an attorney at all. I'm just a landlord has been around a long time. And I have attorneys on my staff here that work for us. And I have um, Denny Dobbins who wrote the crime free addendum is very much in the landlord world. And I just listen to him talk and him tell our clients what to do. Yes or no questions is something you can prove. Yeah. And, and honestly, if they, if they had that, bad of a rap with someone they're probably going to try and not tell you about that landlord <laughs> they're yeah. probably going to say what's the famous thing they say Dave I live with my parents I live with my parents I live with some friends yeah. so and that's a red flag if you hear that it's not necessarily bad it could be true depending on the situation but right. that's probably something you'll hear instead they're probably cool, not going to give you the number to someone yeah. they screwed over. But what's cool about the Rent Perfect system is you get an address history that comes from us. So you look at the address history and then you look at the application they filled out. And if there's an address that's not on the application, you very much will say, well, tell me about this address you lived at. And that's probably the one they don't want you to know about. Right. So we have those tools in Rent Perfect to help you discover if they're kind of cheating the system a little bit. Yeah. Or if they say I'm living with family and friends right now, ask for like a utility bill or something with that address on it, because they're not going to be able to get that if they're not really living somewhere. So right. getting that piece can help you as well. Absolutely. There's another, can I, just a couple more questions, um, which I'm going to, I think, say that these need to go back out to an attorney in your area, because I think these can be different locally. And so I don't think we need to to give specifics on this, but just to, the question is, can we still charge a prospective tenant anything we want for a rental application? I'm gonna say you need to ask locally um, an attorney about that. Um, would you agree? So, so the first landlord that charges $500 application fee, that person's gonna to run to the, the city council or gonna, and, and you're just gonna make us all look terrible. We've had clients we've cut off that went ahead and sent invites out to 10 people got them to pay them a $35 application fee and then picked one out of the 10 as they collected $350 and said, this is a profit center for us. If you're that kind of landlord, we don't want you to use Rent Perfect because that is going to end up biting us all in the future. You might get your $300 a day, but now St. Paul, Phoenix, Arizona, Washington, DC is gonna come in and say, now you can't even charge an application fee, period. And so Which just some states well and that some, that exact same thing that, i'm sorry heather go ahead i was just saying i know that certain cities have passed rules right that they can't charge an application fee yeah. well um and and uh, has worked because of people trying to jack up security deposits for that very same reason um cincinnati now has uh led the way and one of the only ways I don't want us to in enacting legislation that um, you have to offer them a payment plan or insurance to cover um, their security deposit. Right. So when we do things like that, it, it does end up biting us and all of us uh, in the end. So need to be careful with that. But if you have a modest um, fee, 
but you're still curious, I think talking with a local attorney about that uh, could be super helpful. So to do do an extensive background check that we do, it costs $35. The tenant is actually going to pay us $35 directly. That's the cost of the screening. If you're if you're doing an, a Google search and you're saying that screening and you're charging 50 bucks and you're keeping all 50 bucks in your pocket and they can prove that, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have some issues. But they also, also get copies of their reports too. Just I yeah. think everyone knows that, but in case you didn't, so the tenants get a physical you know service and report that they have right. paid for. So well, they pull the, they they pull their own credit, they pull their own criminal history with Rent Perfect, and then they share it. You're not actually pulling their history. Rebecca, sorry, did we interrupt you? That's okay. Um, question, how liable is a current landlord for giving a bad review, even if it's all correct? And I think the, the key there is the word review. I think, as Dave said, anything subjective that is a review uh, can leave the door open for problems. If you are verifying information, the amount of rent, did they pay the rent? Did they leave owing rent? Did they leave, uh, did they get their full security deposit back? Those are all factual and very specific yes and no. I think the word review and and anything subjective could really be um, a problem. So, and even if, even if, you are found not guilty. You, you still have someone filing some kind of fair housing on you, some kind of complaint on you. Is it really worth it? What, how is that benefiting you? I know we want to connect, protect the community. I know we want to hurt the tenant that did us bad, but guess what? In business, you have bad deals. You, you let it go and you move on and you make sure you don't do bad deals in the future. So I would not be reviewing any tenant. I've had, I've had clients say, hey, put a review board through Rent Perfect and let us review. I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole in this day and age. If we were in another day and age, if we were in the 50s, 60s, 70s prior to the internet and somehow we had the means to do that, I, I might consider it today. We're not touching that at all because it's just ripe for the next legislation to come down and, and, and smack us. We get asked that all the time as well. Yeah. But um, another key question. So as a user of Rent Perfect, do you send a list for me to the... Uh, well, it says you send a list for me, but I think they mean to me, to applicants before they pay and apply. Yeah, so we send a copy of the um, criteria that we showed you. When you send them the email, which sends them the online application to, uh, to fill out in that email is your criteria. And it says, please read this criteria before you apply with the property. So we make it super simple. You don't have to have like a manila folder on your front, you know, seat and, and have all these photocopied papers and they get it, they see it. And if they're pushing the button to apply on the screen, we know they got it because they pushed the button on the same screen that the criteria was on. So Dave, we're getting a lot of questions on the use of the, of the Rent Perfect product, which is not exactly what we were going to do today. How about let's agree to uh, have you and Heather come do a run through of the great pieces of the product. We've talked about them before um, on these calls and others. And I know we have information on our website and the locals have that information. But how about we schedule kind of an in-depth run through of that? We'll send it out to everyone um, so they can be here and ask those kinds of operational questions in terms of how it works because we could spend there are yeah. so many great features in the Rent Perfect. Well, seriously, um, everything from the, you know, having the lease there is a sample lease. There are so many great things that the system does that I don't want to kind of use today. Um, I, I agree. For that. I agree. Just call us. If, if you really want to know today, when we get off the phone, just, just give us a call. We're here to answer it. To each each and individual landlord out there. That's why we're here. We want to protect you. So yeah, let's just move on here. How much time do I have, Rebecca? So I need to make sure. I'm going to let you keep going. And then what I'm going to do with my industry update is just email the slides out and then go over them um, next month. Okay. But just I, I one don't have much longer to go. I, I just, okay. Just one really quick things. more. Yeah. One more question is uh, any problems requiring a tenant to carry renter's insurance? No, there's no problem. You can do it through the rent perfect system or national RIA also has, if you're um, if you already have a tenant in and you want to get them um, into uh, insurance, you can also visit our site uh, for that coverage as well. So I'm going to let Dave run and then we'll try to answer because we're already uh, well past our normal time. We'll try to answer some of the rest of these questions um, as we send out the replay and we're going to schedule Dave for a 
uh, call with Heather to kind of walk you through the information. If we could, Heather, if you've not already, I probably could have missed it. Can you put yours um, contact information in for people to reach out to you? Um, yeah, and Lori, can you put a slide and then I'm, gonna, I'm running. Okay. And then Lori, can you put in the um, chat bar a um, our description of um, the Rent Perfect Benefit and then how they can get to that through the National RIA website as well. And then I'm going to hush and let you all continue. I'm so sorry. No, you're Perfect. great. Perfect. We won't be much longer. I just want to tell you about one more strategy we're teaching our clients right now. Uh, once again, we're doing these on Zoom calls all the time with different RIAs around the country. So if your people in your RIA need to hear this, we'll be more than happy to do it. So um, in about September, when we started to see that these eviction moratoriums were going to start lasting and we got through the CARES Act and we thought it was over in the CARES Act. And then here comes early September, the CDC. And that was the writing on the wall that this is not, this is not going away. Um, I decided that in my own rentals and guys, I have 14 rentals. I'm not claiming I'm Mr. Landlord. I'm not claiming um, I know everything at all. I've got 14 rentals. I don't hide that. Um, but I do manage them all myself and run five companies with the Rent Perfect system. And I don't have a property manager, uh, manager and I don't spend a lot of time on my rentals, just to let you know. So I come up with strategic ideas uh, to still have the time that I want, but still manage my properties. And one of the strategies I decided to do is starting on September 25th, five days before rent was due on the 1st, I started doing property inspections. And the reason I did property inspections is I went in and I told my tenants, I said, listen, with these eviction moratoriums, if we get in trouble and you can't pay rent, I can't afford the mortgage. And so I'm going to have to sell the home. And so if I have to sell the home, I'm just coming in to see what's the shape of the carpet, how's the backyard, what am I going to have to fix up? And I kind of gave them this story of you need to make me a pri priority because even with this eviction moratorium, your, your housing might uh, cause some issues for you and for me. In addition to doing that inspection, I was looking for, I have a no pet policy. I was looking for diggings in the yard, dog poop, um, bite marks, dog bowls, uh, anything I could see. I was looking for uh, multiple people there that shouldn't be there. And I've just kind of taken a list of my property to say, hey, if I needed to go down a certain road, I had all of the information. I went ahead and did this October 25th too. I said, guys, I'm gonna start doing this monthly inspection. And this is crazy. What happened in November is I started getting texts from my tenant saying, hey, listen, all is well. We're good. My job's holding up. Rent will be coming. And I started getting this information prior to the beginning of the next month. And so I knew if I was having a problem. So I thought I was going to have to spend all this time doing monthly inspections. And soon I quit doing monthly inspections because this process created a relationship between my tenants and I. And guys, I'm pretty hands off. I, I don't come over and do, I, don't, I have them use the Rent Perfect Pay system. They pay online. I hardly see my tenants on a, you know, month to month basis. And there are landlords that are like, whoa, you should stop by once a month. I know there's all kinds of strategies, but mine is I get good people in there. I let them act like an owner and I only come around when we, we need stuff fixed or, or there's problems. So this allowed me to get a relationship back with my tenants that was positive. And I let them know that you need to make me a priority right now. And so when I showed up on the 25th, five days before rents due, they have me in their mind. So if that night they got a past due for their car in the mail, I'm still there saying you need to pay your rent, even though there's an eviction moratorium. And so we're teaching people to do monthly property inspections, just to gather data on your property that might come useful in the future. If I walked in and there's three dogs in there and then they, they didn't, they're not getting evicted for non-payment of rent. They're getting evicted because they had a lease violation. And that's a whole nother uh, reason to evict. And that's one that we can do right now as we speak today. Who knows what they're going to come up with in the future. And so I recommend teaching to do monthly inspections right now, at least until you start getting your tenants to give you feedback and let you know how they're doing. It's, it's more than ever, you know, and everybody's teaching you better work with your tenants through this time because if it goes blank and you don't hear from them and rent doesn't come in, it's going to be a frustrating time for you as a landlord, not knowing what's going on, not knowing if they're going to pay, not knowing if they're going to leave. Uh, being in the dark is not a good place to be as a landlord. 
Um, and we just want to close with here's the here's the I'm going to I'm going to end with what I started with. If you had the right renter in 2021, if you had the right renter, none of this would be affecting you right now. I have not lost any rent on mine. I'm not saying knock on wood that I've done anything special that you wouldn't do. Luckily, I had the right renters in the right place. I will tell you one story though. I have some renters that've been renting renting for me for 10 years in one of my places. Been a great renter. But the five little kids that were from three to like seven are now like 13 to 18. The five kids in this place each have different friend groups. I sat out for an hour and a half in front of my house the other night because the HOA keeps complaining about so many people coming in and out of my house and I wanna know what's going on. And I saw five different friend groups coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And I now have um, a house that is really being used pretty heavily, but I didn't know that 10 years ago when I rented to them. So I'm kind of in a situation where I've learned a little bit. Um, I can't discriminate. I can't discriminate against familial housing. I can't do that. So I, guess I just got in a situation. Well, the HOA is so mad. They're starting to record my house and they have my own personal cell phone and they're sending me all this information. So the other night I get this video of this kid that goes up on the second story, takes gasoline and pours it down on a fire pit. They bought at Lowe's or something down below and fire rushes up the side of my house. My eaves are wood. Um, so they sent this to me. I saw it, I have proof of it. So I went ahead and contacted my, uh, my tenant and I said, hey, listen, I think our time has come. Um, between us on this phone call, I wanna sell the property anyways. It's just ready to go. It's at the highest prices in the neighborhood. I feel like, I feel like capital gains might be going up. It's just a good year for me to unload one of my properties. And this is the one I want to do. Um, so I, I kind of want them out. And I said, well, listen, because of this, I can't let this, this happen. And my house is in danger. And now that I've seen this, you know, I, I know what I know. And uh, she turned around and said to me, well, you can't evict us because I have COVID. So here I probably can go fight the fight because they're up to date on their rent. But what happens when the next rental period comes? I don't get the rent. And now they claim, well, he's just evicting us because of non-payment of rent. Could I go beat that with an attorney? Could I go into court? Nowadays with our courts, we don't know what we're gonna get when we get to court and people start claiming COVID. My point is, is this, is this has affected me in a way too on a property where I had the right tenant for 10 years and you're all gonna have a good tenant possibly go bad, lose their job, have a housing, have some kind of health issue, good people, bad things happen to good people. And so as landlords, we need to be flexible and keep a good communication. Luckily, I have a good communication with this lady, even though I'm not, I'm not super happy. My whole point of telling you that story is everybody's online now. Everybody knows about the CDC moratorium. If you're a tenant, you know it, and you're going to use it to the best of your ability. So manage your tenants like they know what's going on because they do. And, uh, and I'll tell you how the story ends later, but uh, I'm in the middle of it right now myself with, uh, with that situation. So even when we do everything we can do, our, our chances are a lot better, but we still could get ourselves in a situation, but we still have to go back and say, we are in the best business in the world. We're not, we shouldn't be ready to give up now. And we should just move forward with the tools that we have and make sure that we're protected and so we can continue to grow our wealth into the future. And with that, I am done, Rebecca. There is hope. We are going to get through this and we are going to use all the tools we can to fight like hell. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I would like, because of all the questions that we've got, so that people will know as they uh, come to the next call. Can you tell people, or can you have Heather tell people uh, a, just a little bit about the Rent Perfect system, what all it does cover, um, how the charge uh, for the screening actually is paid by the resident, and there's less than a dollar fee basically uh, if you come through a RIA uh, for the verific basically verification purposes right. that is charged to the uh, owner themselves. Can you give us just a real quick kind of overview, the lease is in there, the screening is in there, the um, rental standards are in there. All of that's provided to them as, uh, well, as a I'm, user of the system. I'm going to go quick and I'm probably going to forget something because there's that much in there. I, I know, all, just a really quick overview. People ask me, why is it 95 cents to sign up? 
I just have to do, I'm not pulling your credit. I'm, I just have to verify who you are. And it costs me money to verify who you are. If I'm going to share someone's credit criminal history with you, I got to know who you are, who you're saying you are. It would be free if I didn't have that charge. So people are like 95 cents. Now, 95 cents is what you pay. And then from there, we get paid by the tenants who pay $35 for their application. That application fee comes to us directly because they're pulling their own credit and they're pulling their own criminal and then they're sharing it with the landlord. That takes away a ton of regulations. But let me just role play with you real quick. If I'm sitting at lunch with a friend, I get a text or a phone call. Hey, we want your place. I've already showed it to somebody. I go into my Rent Perfect app. I send them an email and a text invite. They fill out the online application. I instantly, I get credit with a score. I get an address history. We get everything except for our investigational report that'll come four to six hours later. My investigators are looking into resources that aren't available instantly. So then we go from there. So you'll have to wait six business hours. If you come in at five o'clock, it's not coming at 11 o'clock at night. It'll come the next day. But if anybody needs to move in that night, you don't want them anyways, we can get into that. Okay, from there, if I like them, I then can go into a really quick lease. I've already set up my property. I put in a few values, like how much is rent? How long is the lease for? I can send that off to them. They can go ahead and sign it digitally on their phone. From there, I can then decide to set up a rent uh, schedule payment and I can set up rent payments right online that come into your bank account. From there, once I give them the keys, I can send them an invite to do a move out move in, move out inspection on their phone where they go through each room in the house, they take pictures of what, what is wrong or what's not wrong, or they sign off that the house is acceptable, no repairs or, or nothing, we didn't find anything. Um, what's interesting about that product when we launched it is we thought we'd have a lot of people demanding you come fix all this stuff. All they're doing is like when you rent a, rent a car, you walk around and you say, hey, there's a ding in that car. I don't need it fixed. I just want you to know I didn't do it. So it's just kind of a documenting of the property. Um, and then if you require renter's insurance, we'll keep pounding them with an email and then we'll make them either upload their policy from a state farm, American family, or they can buy renter's insurance through us. Uh, and then the monthly payments start. They start saying your, your rent is due in five days, your rent's due in four days, your rent's due in three days. Hey, your rent's due today. Hey, you're past due. And then all of a sudden, hey, you're past due with rent. And now there's a $10 charge per day and it'll start tracking. So if your tenants go delinquent, they're going to get two emails a day telling them that they're delinquent. I don't have to make those phone calls. Um, they're just getting hit on their email and their text with that communication. So there it is right there in a nutshell. There's much more to it, kind of like the criteria we talked about tonight and kind of the process that works. But we don't have a whole lot of time to go through the whole thing. But that's from start to finish. And then we do a move out inspection when they leave against the pictures of the move in inspections. And we have all that documentation if we need it. And we move on to our next tenant and repeat the cycle. And then there's a question about uh, doing skip trace and or collections. Okay, we don't do collections, but we do have a skip trace component um, that you can go ahead and, and put into our system. That's kind of off on the side. That's not really our flow of onboarding a tenant, but we do have that that ability to do it. I know you also have another provider that does a really good skip trace that could get, um, what, what is the name of that company, Rebecca? You brought them on last year? Uh, <laughs> the National Credit Group, and we do have links to that as okay. well, so. So yeah, our, you can share links. Yeah, ours is, is pretty much, you have the social security number because they used to be a tenant of yours and now you're looking where they've gone, where they work. Oh, like that. you mean IDI. IDI, IDI. is, absolutely amazing um yeah, so yeah that's a whole of, if you're that's a whole of, new level of of being yeah. able to find information we've got a mm -hmm. um Lori, if you could share when we do the replay the replay information from when we had idi on because they you're right they do some yeah. some pretty amazing things so if you're really coming to rent perfect just for skip tracing go to idi come to us to to, to really do the backgrounds on the tenants and manage your property Dave, thank you so much for being with us today. Just to let you know, they do have amazing videos and I think in some ways even better. I love your podcast. Thank we you. uh, link to many of those through our resources on our side and on real estate investing today, but you can also find them. There's some links uh, to the side that we have in the chat for those as well. Rebecca, but Can I just invite people to come to our Facebook, come to our Instagram. A lot of that stuff is filtering through there. And we're putting two or three things out a day in here, whether they're articles, videos, tips, 
uh, this is the we time. We just started we our Instagram, so show us some love. We realized how much education we have and we want to be, you know, more involved in that way. So we just started that. It's easy to find us, Rent Perfect, on Facebook and Instagram too. So sorry to interrupt you, Dave. <laughs> no worries. And Lori's putting some links there for your uh Facebook and um, other links as well. You can find them on their website, those links. Uh, we really appreciate you guys, all the information that you give us. Let's get a time scheduled for a follow-up on kind of how to use the resources that you have available, especially for those of you that are that are already National RIA members, then this is available to you at this great offering and can be so helpful. I, I can't even tell you how much less stress I've had by, uh, we have student rentals, so they turn over every year. So you can imagine how I felt this year heading into COVID and kind of getting that little bit of nerve coming up uh, again, because we start courting them as early as, as April about uh, renewal. So using Dave's system, I tell you, it was, it was interesting and it, and it helped us get those right residents and we've not had a missed payment either, knock on wood and, and uh, uh, thank you, Dave, and the, the universal powers that are keeping me, keeping me uh, supported here. So well, you, uh, Rebecca, you tell me you're not a rich landlord that everybody thinks <laughs> you can- A rich and greedy, mind, <laughs> mind you, rich and greedy <laughs> landlord, uh, yes. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. All right, guys. Thanks so much for being here. I do have some industry updates. I will send, they'll come in the, in the um, PowerPoint, but we'll go over those next time because we have kept you well past what we promised, but I thought it was very valuable. Dave has such great information and I know so many of you are um, in the rental industry. That's why you're here today. And we wanted to make sure he was able to share as much as possible. So thank you for being here. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and warm, especially those of you are, that are in areas that are affected. I'm looking out my window at about 14 inches of snow right now. Have not been able to leave the house for over a week. And at, yeah, Ryan's making fun of me being in Miami where it's warm. So I will hand it back over to you, sir, to close this out uh, and see everyone later. All right. Well, thank you guys uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate um, all our special guests, Rob, Dave, Heather, and of course, Charles, our man on the street with the word of what's happening. We're going to give you that word again. We'll be back uh, March the 19th at four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. In the meantime, stay safe.